Thank you guys again for coming out to Family Chapel. Welcome to FC. Uh, as Pastor Daniel mentioned, my name is Josh. I am one of the pastors here uh, at Family Chapel, and I do have the great privilege of sharing God's word with us today. Uh, well, we're actually starting a new sermon series today, and uh, for the next few months, we'll be going through the book of Galatians. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever read this book before. It's a little letter in the New Testament, but I'm really excited to go through the book of Galatians because here in Galatians, we really get to the heart of the gospel. I mean, we get to the heart of the gospel. You see, throughout this letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul uh, helps them to clearly see what the gospel is, right, this good news about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on our behalf, about what the gospel is, as well as how we are to rightly live in light of that gospel truth. Uh, and if you're with us at retreat last weekend, you, you were reminded again and again and again that we never graduate from the gospel. Right? We never move on from the gospel. It's not like we start with the gospel and then we move on to bigger and, and better things. Rather, the gospel is not merely the ABCs of the Christian faith, but the gospel is the A through Z of the Christian faith. And so if we want to thrive, which is our theme for 2020, right? if we want to thrive, what we need most is not primarily new techniques. Right? What we need most is not primarily innovative methods or novel experiences or you know, new emotional highs or some secret formula. But if we want to thrive in 2020 and beyond, right, what we most need is to grow deeper in the gospel. What we most need is more of the gospel. And so uh, my hope as we make through the book of Galatians for these next few months is that we would become even more rooted and the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That, that we would apprehend all the more just how good the good news really is. That as we are more deeply rooted in the gospel, that we would cultivate lives of healthy discipleship to Christ. And so that's what we're hoping for as we spend the next few months going through the book of Galatians. Now, before we kind of dive into our passage for today, let me lay out some background information to kind of help orient ourselves as we begin to go through this letter to the Galatians. You see, in this letter, a guy named the Apostle Paul is, is writing not just to random strangers, but to his friends in a province of the Roman Empire called Galatia. That's why this letter is called Galatians. Right? He's writing to his friends in Galatia. Now, Galatia is located in modern-day Turkey. Now, these Galatians are friends of Paul that he's met and shared the gospel with during his first missionary journey. Now, if you might remember reading through the book of Acts, after Paul is saved, after he becomes a Christian, Paul is commissioned, he's sent out by Jesus to carry the gospel, the good news, to Gentiles, to non-Jewish people. So Paul goes on this first missionary journey, and he travels through the region of Galatia, and there he meets these Galatians. And he tells them about who Jesus is, and he sees them come to faith in Christ. And he establishes these local churches in the region of Galatia, and then he heads back to his home base. Well, during Paul's absence, while he's not there in Galatia, false teachers have come into the churches in Galatia, and they have begun to spread this false gospel. Now, we'll see more about the, you know, certain descriptions of this false gospel as we go through the book of Galatians. But in essence, their false gospel said that, yes, while you Galatians might have started by grace through faith, if you really want to level up to the next level, if you really want to move ahead, move forward in your faith, you need to go back to the law. You need to go back to Moses. You need to go back to the old covenant. You need to do things like circumcision and refrain from eating pork and, and so on and so forth, right? These false teachers have come in and said, hey, if you really want to be a true Christian, if you want to remain in the kingdom of God, you've got to maintain the religious rituals of the old covenant. You've got to become Jewish, and instead of promoting the true gospel that says that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, these false teachers were saying that true salvation actually comes from our faithful obedience to the works of the law. See, they were advocating a gospel not of Jesus alone, but of Jesus and. Sure, Jesus might have started the work, but you've got to finish it. It's Jesus and your obedience. It's Jesus and your performance. It's Jesus and your religiosity. And unfortunately, the, these Galatians were just swallowing up this false gospel hook, line, and sinker. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. This makes no sense at all. This makes no sense at all. Like, why would anyone exchange a free gift for something you have to pay for? Like, if someone had, like, 
tickets to Hawaii, right? And he said, hey, Josh, you can either take these tickets to Hawaii for free or you can pay me $500 for them. Of course, I would take these tickets for free, right? Because I love free stuff, right? Of course, I would take it for free. So it seems kind of mind-boggling that these Galatians would exchange the true gospel of free grace for this false gospel of earned wages. Why? Well, I think a major reason why the Galatians, and if we're honest, we ourselves, can sometimes find ourselves preferring this false gospel of earned wages is because if I earn my salvation, I'm in control. If I earn my salvation, then God is in my pocket. If I earn my salvation, I get to call the shots. I get to make the demands. If I earn my salvation, I am owed certain things. I paid for this service, so God, you better deliver. Just as an analogy, um, you know, let's say that I had a friend, and my friend invited me over to his place to spend the night because I was there for whatever reason, and I didn't want to pay for a hotel or whatever, right? And so I, I, my friend lets me stay over at their place for the night for free. But the hot water is not working, <laughs> I got to sleep on the floor because there's no extra mattress at his place. And for breakfast, he serves me oatmeal. And I hate oatmeal, right? Like if, that, if that were to happen, here's the thing. I would not say one word of complaint. Right? In fact, the only thing I would say is, hey, thank you so much for allowing me to stay over at your place for free. Like, it's like the best ever, right? And I would never stay at this place ever again, right? Like, that's just what would happen. But let's say that instead, instead, I paid $200 to stay at a hotel. At this hotel, the hot water was not working, and there was no mattress in the room, and the supposedly amazing full-service continental breakfast that they promised was included in the price was just oatmeal. If that happened, I'm having a chat with the front desk. Right? If that happened, I'm creating a Yelp account to leave some bad reviews about this hotel. If that happened, I'm asking for my money back. Why? Because I paid for this. I paid for this. See, the true gospel of free grace has God as God. The true gospel of free grace has God calling the shots. He's the king. I owe him everything because he's paid for everything. But this false gospel of earned wages allows us to be God. If I earned my salvation, you owe me, God, because I paid for this. If I earn my salvation, you owe me, God, because I deserve this. I deserve heaven. I deserve blessings. I deserve my prayers to be answered when I want, as I want. I deserve comfort and ease, health and wealth and prosperity. I am owed this because I earned this. See, for the Galatians, this false gospel was so appealing. And like the Galatians, we too are in danger of adopting this false gospel. We, too, can be in danger of losing the good news in a fake news world. Now, Paul's heard about what's been happening in Galatia, and Paul recognizes the serious nature of getting the gospel wrong, of, submitting, uh, of substituting good news for fake news. And so he writes them this letter, this letter that we're going to be looking at for the next few months. And in this letter to the Galatians, Paul defines what the gospel is, and he defends the true gospel. He exposes what fake news looks like, and he points his friends to good news. And so as Paul kind of opens up his letter, he, he brings up some important elements of the true gospel that the Galatians had either been ignoring, forgetting, or pushing to the side. And he brings up these core features of why the good news is truly good. And so with all that in mind, we're now ready to kind of dive into the first part of our passage for today. And so if you have a Bible with you, you're going to turn with me to the book of Galatians. We'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 for now. Uh, you can also open up to the bulletins. It's printed there for you to look at. Uh, it'll also be projected up for you on the screens to follow along. But we'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And, and here Paul reminds us of what the true gospel is. And he writes this in Galatians 1, verses 1 through 5. He writes, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
man, we'll pause here for a bit. See, here in this introductory section of the letter, uh, Paul does three things, right? Number one, Paul identifies himself, tells him that he's an apostle. Secondly, he identifies his hearers, the people that he is writing this letter to. And, and lastly, he gives them a nice introductory greeting. Now, this is very typical of Paul's letters. If you read his other letters in the New Testament, you see this very common structure at the start of his letters. But here's the thing. This isn't just boilerplate, copy-paste kind of language. Rather, here, Paul is laying out some of the central aspects of the gospel that were especially relevant to the Galatians because these are things that they have either forgotten, ignored, or chosen not to remember. And I just want to briefly point out what Paul brings up here. Four aspects of the true gospel that Paul highlights for the Galatians and for us to see. Four things, real quick. First, we see here that, number one, that the true gospel is divinely authoritative. The true gospel is divinely authoritative. In other words, the good news is an authoritative message that comes to us directly from God. Unlike fake news, which is marked by human invention or human lies or human deceit, good news is marked by God's authoritative truth. And we see this in how Paul introduces himself, right? He says in verse 1, if you look again at verse 1, that he is an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, it's not uncommon for Paul to refer to himself as an apostle. He, he does that most of the time in the different letters that he writes to all these different churches. But here, Paul seems to be going out of his way to make it crystal clear that his authority as an apostle does not come from any human authority. It's not because he was commissioned by another leader. It's not because he was sent out by another church. But it comes directly from Jesus himself. And as a commissioned apostle, he uniquely bears an authoritative message from the authoritative king. He serves as an official representative of King Jesus. And so when he proclaims the gospel message, it's as though Jesus, the king himself, is proclaiming the gospel message. And here it seems like Paul is emphasizing his unique apostleship because the false teachers who have infiltrated the churches in Galatia have been going around trying to give uh, some doubt to Paul's gospel by denying Paul's credentials. Right? They're going around and saying to the Galatians, who is this Paul guy anyway? Right? He's not one of the original 12 disciples. I mean, we don't even know where he came from. He's like just some self-proclaimed, self-appointed kind of guy. As far as we know, he has no authority. And as far as we know, the message that he has has no authority. Well, to that, Paul reminds the Galatians that the gospel he has shared with them has authority because he has been commissioned and sent by the one who has all authority. He speaks on behalf of King Jesus. And so every time the true gospel is proclaimed, it's not just an opinion to be entertained. Every time the true gospel is proclaimed, it's not just good advice to consider, but rather every time the true gospel is proclaimed, it is a divinely authoritative message that is to be received. That's the first thing that we see here. That the true gospel is divinely authoritative. Well, secondly, in Paul's introduction, we see here that number two, that the true gospel centers on the person and work of Jesus Christ. The true gospel centers on the person and work of Jesus Christ. In other words, the good news focuses on who Jesus is and on what Jesus has done. Unlike fake news, which is fixated upon the accomplishments of man, the good news is fixated upon the accomplishment of Christ. And we see this in how Paul continues on with verses 3 and 4. If you look there, he says this. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. See, at the heart of the true gospel is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Here, Paul reminds his friends that it is solely on the basis of Christ's life, death, and resurrection that they are redeemed from their sins. See, while the false teachers were emphasizing their own works of the law, their own ability to obey the law, Paul points them not to their work, but to the work of Christ. See, while the false teachers were trying to get the Galatians to add to Jesus, Paul reminds them that it's only through Jesus. And if Jesus is not at the center, I don't know what you have, but it's not Christianity. If Jesus is not at the center, I don't know what you have, but it's not the gospel. It's not good news. Because Jesus and Jesus alone stands at the center of the true gospel. That's the second thing that we see here in Paul's introduction. Well, thirdly, moving along, we see that number three, the true gospel provides true life. The true gospel provides true life. 
true life. In other words, the good news brings us into a new way of life, into a life that actually, truly, fully thrives. Unlike fake news, which keeps us stuck in the old ways, which never leads to life, good news brings us into a new way, a new covenant that brings us new life. And we see this at the end of verse 4, when Paul writes about how Jesus has delivered us from the present evil age. And there's some background info that we need to kind of keep in mind to really appreciate what Paul is referring to here. You see, in the Jewish mindset at this time, there was a distinction between this age and the age to come. Right? This age and the age to come. This age is marked by sin and death and rebellion and suffering. This age is under the curse of sin. It's, it's what Paul's referring to in verse 4 when he says, the present evil age. Now, in contrast to this age, there is an age to come. And the age to come is when the kingdom of God finally is established and all things are made right. All things are restored and we begin to live under the rule and reign of God under his perfect shalom, his perfect peace. That's the age to come. Now, what the false teachers did not understand was that in the gospel, Jesus has inaugurated or Jesus has initiated the age to come. By virtue of his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has initiated the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Now, the age to come is not yet fully here, right? There are still plenty of things that are broken all around in our world, but it has begun. It's not yet fully here, but it has begun. And in this new age, we no longer live under the old covenant. We no longer live under the old rules of the old ways. But now in this new age, we find ourselves living under a new covenant. In this new age, no longer are we under the law of Moses. But now in this new age, we live by the spirit of Christ. And we'll see more of this as we go through the book of Galatians, what the differences are between the old covenant and the new covenant. But for now, what we need to understand here is that these false teachers were encouraging the Galatians not to move forward, but to go backwards to Moses, to go back to the law, to go back to the old covenant, because it's there where you'll find life. But here, Paul reminds them that true life is not found back there, but true life is found in Christ. Don't go back. Go forward. Don't go back to the old ways. Find yourself in the new covenant. Don't go back to your BC days, your before Christ days. No, find new life, true life, a thriving life in Christ. See, the gospel and the gospel alone provides true life. That, that's number three. Last thing, number four, here in Paul's introduction, we see that number four, that the gospel gives glory to God alone. The gospel brings glory to God alone. In other words, the good news gives all the credit to God for carrying out his work of redemption. Unlike fake news, which seeks to give credit to man's accomplishments or man's obedience or man's effort or man's participation, the true gospel recognizes that from start to finish, it is all God's doing, and so all the glory goes to God alone. As Paul writes at the end of verse 4 and into verse 5, he tells us that the gospel is according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He recognizes that this is according to the will of God our Father. It's God who sets up this plan. It's God who puts this plan into motion. It's God who sustains its plan as it's being carried out. And it's God who will accomplish this plan. In other words, it's God who saves. It's God who sanctifies right now. And it's God who secures his people for eternal life with him. God alone does the work of the gospel. And so God alone deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. See, the true gospel brings glory to God alone. And so we see here that Paul begins his letter by unpacking some core truths of what the true gospel is. And as we've seen so far, four things. Number one, the true gospel is divinely authoritative. Number two, the true gospel centers on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Number three, the true gospel brings true life. And lastly, number four, the true gospel brings glory to God alone. Right? This is what... Paul wants the Galatians to remember in the first five verses of his introduction. Now, normally, when you read through kind of Paul's letters, he'll have a very similar format, a similar style. And he'll always begin with an introduction, or mostly he'll begin with an introduction. And right after his introductory section where he, you know, identifies himself, identifies his hearers, and gives a little greeting, usually, more often than not, he'll follow up that introductory section with a thanksgiving section. 
And he'll give thanks to God and thanks to the people. He'll share his gratitude for everything that God has done in and through his people. That's the usual order of things in all the other letters that we read in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul. But here, when it comes to the letter to the Galatians, Paul skips the entire Thanksgiving section, right? It's not because he's not thankful, but it's because there's something so serious, something so pressing, something that's so at hand happening in the churches of Galatia that Paul skips all that and dives straight into the, the, to, into the matter at hand. Right, without skipping a beat, Paul expresses his, his deep concern and how shocked he is at how his friends have been seriously entertaining a false gospel proclaimed by these false teachers. Now keep in mind, these are not strangers to Paul. These are friends that Paul has met on his first missionary journey. What that, means, what that means is that these are some of the very first people that Paul had the privilege of sharing the gospel to. And these are some of the very first people that Paul had the privilege of seeing come to faith in Christ. In other words, what that means is when he sees the Galatians, he sees them as like his first kids. They are his spiritual children. And if you've read through the book of Acts, you know that his first missionary journey was not easy. When he was traveling through the region of Galatia, he was faced with all sorts of obstacles and persecution. In fact, in one of the major cities of Galatia called Lystra, there as he was preaching the gospel, the people there were so mad at him that they picked up these gigantic rocks from the ground and they started to hurl it at his head. They, they wanted to stone him to death. And he was hit and he fell to the ground so much to the point that they thought that he was dead. So they took his lifeless body, dragged it out of the city, and left him there to die. Well, Acts tells us that after that, he gets up, beaten and bruised, and he walks back into the city to claim the gospel, that, uh, to finish the gospel message that he had started before he was stoned. See, as Paul goes through this missionary journey, especially in the region of Galatia, it was difficult. It was hard. But it was also very fruitful. And so these friends are near and dear to his heart. And so I can only imagine, can only imagine what, what Paul is feeling here as he writes this letter to his friends. I can only imagine the shock and the frustration and the sadness and maybe even the anger as he addresses his friends who have been turning away from the true gospel. Right? These are people he has known and loved for years. These are people whom he has risked his life for, and now they are being tempted to pull away from the gospel truth and turn to a false gospel. And so with all the love and affection and sternness and seriousness of a spiritual father aiming to correct his spiritual sons and daughters, Paul urges them to step away from this false gospel. Don't go down that road. And he gives two broad reasons why they are to step away from this false gospel. And the first reason, number one, is because a false gospel is fake news. False gospel is fake news. In other words, a false gospel is a sham. It's a phony, right? It's not true. And that's because there is no other gospel. There is no other good news by which we find salvation. A false gospel is fake news. Right, take a look at verses 6 to 7 as Paul exposes the false gospel of the false teachers. And he calls it out as fake news. He writes this in verses 6 and 7. He writes, I am astonished. I'm shocked. My jaw is dropped to the floor. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Here, Paul clarifies that there is no other gospel. Right? There's no other gospel apart from the gospel of Christ. There's no other good news out there that offers true salvation. The other gospel being proclaimed by these false teachers is really no gospel at all. Rather, their gospel, their false gospel, is fake news. Again, this false gospel being peddled around by these false teachers stated that you could earn and keep your salvation by doing good works, by adhering to the law of Moses, by doing things like circumcision and refraining from eating pork and, and so on and so forth, by adhering to these religious practices. But that's just not true. So you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so Paul doesn't approve of their false gospel because it sounds kind of true, or because it seems partly true, or because it has some elements of the truth. But he calls it out as a totally different gospel. It's fake news. I might think, but Josh, what's the big deal? We live in a fake news world, right? 
Our, our, our world is constantly bombarded by fake news. It seems like every other day, hashtag fake news is trending on Twitter as people claim things to be true that are not true. Uh, even in our social media feeds with our Instagrams and Facebooks and, and TikToks, it's essentially a carefully curated section of fake news, right? Ain't nobody really happy paying $150 to go to Disneyland, right? right? Ain't nobody like, yeah, man. Like, no, it's fake news, right? But even in a fake, nothing against Disneyland. I, I love Disneyland. But anyways, right, but even in a fake news world, right, even in as we find ourselves in a world bombarded by fake news, the truth matters. The truth matters. Right? If you deposit $100 in the bank and the bank tells you that you actually only deposited $50, that matters. <laughs> if you studied hard for your final exam and you got a 95%, but the professor tells you that actually you only got a 65%, that matters, right? If you go to McDonald's and you order a 20-piece Chicken McNuggets and they only give you 15 pieces, that matters, right? Even in a fake news world, the truth matters. And perhaps especially in a fake news world, the truth matters. See, contrary to our postmodern, post-truth culture, post-truth world that says truth is actually relative, Truth is whatever you want to be true. Truth is what you feel to be true. What's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. Actually, in contrast to our postmodern, post-truth world, what's actually true actually matters. It does. And the truth does not change. The truth does not change. And as the truth, the gospel does not change. Even if it is politically incorrect, the gospel does not change. Even if it is criticized and denounced by the higher-ups of society, the gospel does not change. Even if it is challenged with the threat of persecution, with burned-down homes and bombed-out churches, as it's so common amongst our brothers and sisters all around the world, the gospel does not change. Because the truth does not change. And so here, Paul goes at it with such ferocity and adamancy because a false gospel is fake news. Anything that claims to offer true life apart from Christ, outside of Christ, is just not true. But secondly, Paul is so worked up here, Paul is so adamant here, not only because a false gospel is fake news, but also because, number two, a false gospel is bad news. A false gospel is bad news. A false gospel is not just a misguided opinion. A false gospel is not just a mistaken suggestion, but a false gospel is bad news because a false gospel keeps you from the truth. And a false gospel, when taken to its logical end, never leads to life. But a false gospel, when it's taken to its logical end, always leads to destruction. All right, take a look at verses 8 through 9 as we kind of close out our passage for today. Verses 8 through 9, Paul kind of highlights how a false gospel is bad news. And he writes this in verse 8 and 9. But even if we, himself included, or an angel from heaven, an angelic messenger, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse. That's really strong language in the Greek. It's almost as like Paul is cussing here. And as we have said before, so now I say again, he, he repeats himself here. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Here, Paul is using very strong language and even repeats himself to emphasize the serious nature of getting the gospel wrong. Because a false gospel is not just fake news. A false gospel is bad news. When fake news is the difference between life and death, Fake news is not just fake news, it's bad news. Right, when your doctor tells you that you're healthy, when in fact you have cancer, and so you don't take any treatment or receive any medical care, that's not just fake news, that's bad news. When your boss tells you that the company is doing just fine, you don't need to worry about your mortgage or your, pay, uh, or your pension, when in reality the company is about to go bankrupt in the next week and you're about to lose your job, that's not just fake news, that's bad news. When a false teacher tells you that your acceptance before God can be earned and merited by your obedience or your righteousness or your religious performance, that's not just fake news. That's bad news. 
So here, Paul musters up as strong a language as he can think of to get the Galatians and us to realize that if they continue to go down this path of the false gospel of earned wages, they are headed for destruction. So he says, let anyone, I don't care if it's me, an angel, a famous apostle, I don't care, whoever, let anyone who preaches a false gospel, let them be accursed, anathema in the Greek. Literally, let that person come under the wrath of God, judgment and condemnation for leading people astray, for saying peace, peace when there is no peace, for tricking people into thinking that they are somehow safe outside of Christ, for sending people along the path of destruction. No, a false gospel is not just fake news. It's bad news. And unfortunately, there is a very popular false gospel running rampant throughout American Christianity today. It's what sociologist and professor Christian Smith at the University of North Carolina calls moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Deism, or MTD for short. So he coined this term back in 2005 after conducting a massive nationwide survey interviewing thousands of Americans about what they believe to be true about God. And the vast majority of these people, even those who self-identified as Christians, the, mass, the, the, mass, uh, the vast majority of these people held to what they eventually came to call moralistic, therapeutic deism. This is their gospel. See, MTD, it's moralistic. Because the primary goal of MTD is to be a good person. That's all that matters, right? As long as you're good, you're fine. And if you're a good person, good things will happen to you in your life. If you're a good person, karma, luck, God, whatever you call it, will make certain things happen in your life. And if you're good enough, when you die, you get to go to heaven to be with God forever, right? At the end of the day, it's moralistic. It's also therapeutic because MTD places the highest value not just on being good, but on feeling good. What matters the most in your life is that you feel good, that you're comfortable, that you're content. It's all about succeeding, all about attaining your goals, all about reaching your potential. Make a lot of money. Go travel the world. We're supposed to be living our best life now. It's therapeutic. It's about feeling good. And lastly, MTD is a form of deism. Deism is a, is a theology that says, yes, God exists. I believe he's a creator. But he's not that involved in our lives. He's kind of set everything up in the universe, and he's kind of left the picture. That's deism. And the only time that God gets involved in my life is when I'm in trouble, and I call on him like he's some sort of heavenly butler or some vending machine to give me what I need. I don't need a relationship with him. See, this is deism. And this is the predominant gospel, false gospel, that is found in many, if not most, American churches today. If you were to ask 10 random strangers, even 10 self-proclaimed Christian strangers, to ask them what they think Christianity is about, I'm fairly confident that instead of hearing about Jesus, you will more likely get answers about being a good person or trying to go to church when you can on Christmas or Easter or if you have time or about getting a, t a free ticket into heaven. But friends, this is a false gospel. And this false gospel is both fake news and bad news. It's fake news in the fact that it's not true. <laughs> God is not some pie-in-the-sky butler who comes to fix our problems every time we, we ring a bell. No, he's the holy king. And he's the holy king that we have rebelled against in our sin. And this false gospel is also bad news. It's bad news in that it condemns people into thinking that they can somehow be good enough on their own to earn God's favor and acceptance. But the only way to be good enough is to receive the goodness of another to receive the goodness of Christ, the righteousness, the perfection of Christ, the righteousness that Jesus provides. And much like the Galatians, we too need to be weary of falling for the trap of exchanging the true gospel for this false gospel. So to kind of wrap up today's sermon, here's one simple application for us to, to walk away with, really simple. We must hold on to good news in a fake news world. We must hold on to good news in a fake news world. In other words, we, we must faithfully hold on to, articulate, defend the gospel as we find ourselves living in a world filled with false gospels, living in a world filled with fake news and bad news. And so here's the question for you. If someone were to ask you to share the gospel with them right now, what would you say? Hey, I want to hear about who Jesus is and what he's done. Like, what would you say? 
would we have the, the words to share about the good news? Would we be able to articulate the good news with them? Would we be able to share with them that God is holy? And in his holiness and righteousness and goodness, he created mankind for fellowship with him. To enjoy the, the goodness of his holiness together forever. But in our sin, as, as sinful people, we have rebelled against his kingdom, his authority, his kingship, and we have severed, broken that relationship with God. And because God is holy and good and just, he cannot just simply let sin slide under the rug. No, he has to deal with it because he has to uphold his righteousness and holiness and goodness. But there's a problem. We're the ones who broke this relationship. We're the one who sinned against God. And out of God's justice and righteousness, we rightly, justly deserve condemnation. But here's the good news of the gospel, that God the Father, the very one we have sinned and rebelled against, sends his own son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die a sacrificial death, and to rise again from the dead so that anyone who puts their faith and trust in him can be saved. So that anyone who puts their faith in him is able to transfer their sins unto him and to receive his perfection, his righteousness, his goodness unto themselves. So that when God looks at them, no longer does he see their sin any longer, but he sees the perfection and righteousness of his own son and all who would hear this news are called to respond in repentance and faith to turn away from themselves to turn away from their sin and to turn to Christ and to Christ alone as Lord and Savior friends this is the gospel this is the only good news in a world filled with fake news and, and bad news this is the only good news that saves the world right now is longing for some good news. Just turn on the news, flip through Instagram. It's a mess out there. But here in the gospel, we have the greatest good news. So Family Chapel, in a world that is filled with fake news, in a world that is filled with counterfeit gospels, would we uplift the true gospel? In a world that is so hungry and desperate to hear something good and true and beautiful, would we uplift the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ? Would we hold on to good news in a fake news world? You can bow your heads with me at this time. We'll spend some time in prayer as we respond and reflect on God's word together. Um, can you take a moment to just simply reflect on the gospel message? And for some of you, you've, you've heard the gospel a thousand times already. Would you hear it again? Because the gospel is not old news. It's not something we move on from. But the gospel is good news. And it's news that we need to hear again and again and again. And so would you take a moment to reflect on that? And for those of you who are hearing this gospel message, maybe for the first time, or, or maybe for the first time in a very long time, Maybe you've kind of brushed it aside. Would you consider receiving this good news? Would you turn away from the fake news that is so prevalent in our world and receive the good news that is only found in Jesus? Let's spend some time in prayer as we respond to God's word together. Let's pray.